Disclaimer. All views expressed on what makes us fire are solely those of the person or persons giving them. What makes us fire does not represent or claim to represent any particular city or fire department and therefore make the claim that all views and standpoints are affiliated with what makes us fire and with what makes us fire only. Any mention of certain fire departments or cities within the interviews are solely for informational and opinion-based dialogue. In short, if you have a problem with what's published, just say something about it and don't be a Richard. All right, what makes us fire family? Welcome to the show. This is Josh, your host. Today we have Mr. Ryan Willard, better known as I'm going to die happy on TikTok. Look, I know I get a lot of my guests from social media. However, the people that I'm getting are people that are sharing stories and making a difference. I've been getting a little bit of flack of the people that I'm having on. However, Fuck you. It's as simple as that. If you don't want to listen, don't listen. But if you do, I hope you learn something. I don't mind either way. I appreciate you being here. I appreciate giving it a shot. But come on, have some fun. Try to learn something. Ryan is a man that is a huge advocate for PTSD awareness, not only for military, but for all civil service personnel, including first responders. Ryan's found a way to really kick off his message with sharing his story on TikTok, being raw, being fearless in showing his emotion. Ryan has battled some of these demons himself, being a former Leo law enforcement officer and having a brother who had committed suicide coming back from war. Ryan's been battling some pretty tough demons and he's not afraid to tell you about it. And because of that, he allows other people to know that they shouldn't be afraid to talk about it either. What makes us fire family? Please help me welcome Mr. Ryan Willard, better known as I'm a die happy 304 on TikTok. I have a- no words right now for the state of mind. So I tell you, hey, man, uh, since your schedule opened up, would you mind doing it a little bit earlier? You say, yeah, sure. I'm like, awesome. But then I kind of don't feel bad because it takes you for fucking ever to get back to me on anything. So, <laughs> <laughs> but I still felt bad because like, so this morning was jam packed. I have an RD. I have to, I uh, one of my buddies at the fire department wanted to borrow it. I said, sure. So I had to go to the RV, show them how to use it, get all them hooked up and everything. Run to the post office to send off a pen that we raffled off for the foundation. And then I came here and my wife reminds me, we don't have internet service. And they're like, well. <laughs> yeah. And so I'm like. Way to start this day. <laughs> I'm like, fuck, <laughs> like, <laughs> shit. <laughs> so That's I spend, fun. I spend ten minutes trying to fuck with the damn router. I don't know what it is. I think the router's completely fucked. Whatever, yeah. and so I can't do it. And so I'm thinking, I'm gonna have to, I'm gonna have to reschedule this thing. And this dude has put me off forever. And then finally, I'm gonna be like, you know what? It's my turn for you. I'm like, fuck, <laughs> no, don't do that. <laughs> God, damn, you've been you've been on this guy about getting him on the show and constantly hounding him, and then the uh, day he says yes, and the time we set up, you're like, I sorry, forgot, man, I bro. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, nah, it I shit the bed on this one. My bad. Uh, it'd have been fine, man. I'm so laid back. If you would have called and been like, "Hey, there's aliens outside," I'd have been like, "All right, I'll see you next week." <laughs> mm-hmm. So, and then on top of that, every, uh, every morning when I drive into work or drive home from work, I go live, uh, just to say hi to everybody, say good morning, you know, yeah. let them know how the day went, everything else. So, People really, they really seem to like those like morning, morning lives. Yeah. Uh, they, I, what I noticed, what I noticed is most people, when they get a good, happy feeling, when they wake up in the morning, they tend to carry that feeling with them. Right. So, yeah. When, like when you have a good dream and you wake up from a really good dream, 
you feel good. Like you just feel good through the day. You get your cup of coffee. You're like, oh, yeah. a really good dream. I feel rested. When you have a nightmare. You're just then when you're alive. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this nightmare. <laughs> Now, uh, when you have a dream, when you have a dream where you mess the bed, that's a really good dream. Anyway, we're not going to talk about that. Yeah. So I remember like <laughs> there was a time like you ever dream like you're actually like you you have a dream you're pissing and then you're like oh shit oh, <laughs> you wake up you're like I'm actually I pissed the bed. I, I think I yeah. drink. <laughs> I wasn't talking. I wasn't talking about messing the bed like that. Yep, I was that was the thing. <laughs> I was, I was talking about the other thing. Oh, wet dreams. Sorry. Yeah, 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 that one. <laughs> nice. That one. Those happen too. Uh, yep, yep. Those are really good dreams. Those are really good. Dreams. <laughs> oh my god! Good and good. by the way, good. this is how the podcast is starting. What makes us fire, family? Okay. Welcome to What Makes Us Fire. On the episode today, I have my good friend here, Ryan Willard. I say good friend because he's going to be my good friend. We we're still getting to know each other. We met through social media. Uh, actually, you were referred to me from my vice president of the foundation. She she saw your videos and thought yeah. you'd be somebody perfect for the show. Um, Ryan, thank you for coming on the show, brother. I appreciate it. Oh, no problem, man. Yeah. Oh, <laughs> Ryan, sorry, it took um, so sorry, it took so long to get. No to get shit. Here. And then, of course, it takes me forever to actually get on when I tell you I'm going to get on. Um, so Ryan, usually what I like to do, man, I like to share how we met or and how we came in contact with the listeners and with the family here at What Makes Us Fire, uh, just so we can give a little bit of a background of how we, and of how this all came to be. And then we're going to go into a little bit about you, about your story, and then into yep. what you're doing. Uh, so we met because Ariel conservative area on tiktok she's my vice president for the foundation that we're starting for the nonprofit that we're starting and yeah you know, it's in the beginning phases and everything but we're looking for like-minded individuals that have a reach that have yeah. a a family that's big enough to spread the message of what we're doing as well and then in the process hopefully help spread your message so yeah. I was like, okay, yeah. And then she sent me your picture first via text. And I'm like, I don't know if I want to have a better looking dude than me on the show. <laughs> I don't know about that, man. It's just the beard. The beard just, the beard well, just does it. The thing is, is I can't grow a beard because of the job, right? We can't put it yeah. on our face because of the job. So, But even if I did, I'd yeah. look more like Keanu Reeves' beard, like all nasty, scraggly. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> But anyway, I oh, saw. I was just John, like, John Wick's good. Yeah, he is. He's badass. And I was like, God dang, it. yeah, he's a good looking dude. And then I went to go watch some of your videos. I'm like, oh shit, this did this dude did some jujitsu MMA. He's a little ripped. He's got tattoos. Yeah, he looks like a dude's dude. And then I saw your content. <laughs> and then I actually like I, this was before actually clicking on any certain video, right? I saw your content, and I was like, oh shit. Uh, it's it, it, it got pretty serious pretty quick after you know yeah so i was thinking to myself you know all right first who is this guy that she's sending me to and second you know i'm just you know how they show little little one second clips of your videos when you scroll through them i'm like this doesn't look like anything yeah. i don't know i don't know yeah. what's going on here so i finally clicked on one it's the one where uh you're wondering why nobody cares about you like you care about them right like why isn't yeah. why do i feel like i help yeah. everybody but nobody's helping me and that was the one uh bar none uh stitched with you was it bar yeah. none? yes it was bar none bar none stitched yeah. with you yeah it was bar none that, it was that video and i was just i was like okay yeah this this guy this guy is exactly what we're about in that he is not afraid to show the human emotion that is PTSD, depression, sadness, yeah. anger. And I was, okay, this guy falls in line. He is not afraid to show these emotions. And that's part of what, what makes us a fire is about is we're trying to kill 
that fucking stigma of oh, yeah. mental health issues, right? We're trying to kill the stigma of your man, suck it up. We're trying to kill those stigmas because that's just what they are. They're stigmas. They're, they're not real. They're just yeah. this make believe thing exactly. that somebody came up with that we just, for some reason fell in line with. Yeah. So I watched your videos. I was like, okay, all right. I know what he's about now a little bit. He's very forward. And so she said, here's his number. Call him. So I called you. We actually had a pretty good first conversation. It wasn't, there was no, yeah. Hey, I'm Josh. Blah, blah, blah. blah. It, it was like, we automatically just kind of <laughs> hit it off. It was like, yeah. it was like, we already kind of knew what we were about. Uh, there's no bullshit yeah, in between, no small talk. No. So you were down with it. You're down with the cause. You're down to come on the podcast. And then it took a few weeks, a couple weeks, not a few, took a couple of weeks to get you on. Uh, yeah, my bad. <laughs> no. Well, you're a busy guy. And not to mention me messaging you. I could only imagine how many messages you get. And, yeah. you know, your content that you have to put out. People are constantly looking for your content. When's the new one? When's the new one? When's the new one? It's like. <laughs> I still got a job. I still got a normal life. Yeah. I still got to do yeah. all this normal shit. <laughs> yeah. Um, it gets overwhelming, man. I bet. I bet. Uh, you grew. Yeah. I mean, you've only been on the app uh, for what, two months? Yeah. Well, just a little over two months. Yeah. And you're already over 200,000. Yeah. Family. So we, uh, we hit 270. Yeah. We hit 270,000 last night. 270,000 last night. Yeah. I just hit 20K. But, <laughs> well, but, gonna, we'll get you there, man. Well, it, it, it's, but here's the thing, man. Look, I got on, I got on the uh, social media, all the social media platforms. I, TikTok was like the last one I got on, yeah. but I got on all the social media platforms for the sole reason yeah. promoting the podcast, right? And it wasn't until recently yeah. Yeah. that the true message of what makes us fire became to be. So I'm, yeah. I'm not going to lie. Would it be great to have that many family members and friends, a part of what makes us fire family? Absolutely. Absolutely. It would help the mm -hmm. cause. It would help the foundation. It would help the podcast. Sure. I'd be stupid and dumb to say, no, I don't want that. Right. Yeah. But, but I'm okay with us growing at our pace. Yeah. And I think too, like for me, like, it, it was overnight. So I kind of did TikTok as a dare at first. Um, you know, a friend of mine called me and he was like, Hey, dude, got a thousand followers. And I was like, Okay. Like, I don't even know. What, I didn't even know what TikTok was. And I was like, I could do that. He was like, Whatever. So I put uh, the video of the pink shorts. I don't know if you've seen the pink shorts video. Yeah, I've seen the pink shorts. <clears throat> of so course, that's, that's what shorts. started it. Yeah, so that's what started it, and you know, I woke up overnight uh, with over a million views and ten thousand followers, and I thought, you know, here's my chance to to do something productive and to help people and give back. So, and it all just it just grew from over there, and I, you know, I just wanted to make things that people would resonate with, you know, because I know my own struggles, and I know I had to navigate through those by myself. I had no one to help me figure that out, and a lot of that became because. I was ashamed to let that emotion out to even be able to try to get help. You're afraid and, to talk it know, out. Because like, yeah. And I, you know, just like you said, the stigma, I have always been that guy. Like I'm, I'm tattooed, cut up. I've fought professionally in Thailand, you know, and I'm getting in a cage with another dude in my underwear and beat each other up. So, you know, it, for me, it was like, if I show that emotion, it's just going to make me look weak. And, you know, in reality, it actually made me weaker not showing that emotion because I couldn't move forward. Exactly. And we're going to get into all that. Um, I don't want to jump the gun on it, but for everybody listening, there's a little snippet of what we're going to talk about later. What I do want to ask you, Ryan, is very simple, man. Where do you come from? Um, you know, where did you grow up? Where did the mind of Mr. Ryan come from? You know, how did it develop? <laughs> so, uh, what was your family life like? All that kind of fun stuff. Uh, I come from a little place called West Virginia. 
So a lot of people think that West Virginia is actually Virginia, but it's not. We are our own state. Um, we're the better, better Virginia. <laughs> so I, I was born um, in Virginia. Uh, I was a okay. Navy. I was a Navy brat. So Portsmouth. Oh, nice, nice. Yeah. Um, so I, you know, that's where I'm from, man. It's, it's a tiny little coal mining state. Um, it's basically been dying for several years. There's not much here. It's a very poor place. Um, but you probably won't find some of the most kinder people in the country here. Like you, 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 we still drive down the road. You wave at people. Somebody's broke down on the side. You stop exactly what you're doing, and you, you, know, you want to help. You try to help. Um, you know, it's just, in my opinion, it's, it's a beautiful state. I love it here, and probably be here for the rest of my life. I don't see myself going anywhere anytime soon. So, so you grew up there, and you just stayed. You're just staying there. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, oh, so, so you know, and I've traveled. Just, I've traveled a lot long. Well, I mean, I'm not saying. I mean, traveling's different, right? But home is home, right? Home where home, you, yeah. where you put your roots, that's home. Sure, you can live that's somewhere right. else, but home yeah. is home, and you just you mm-hmm. want to stay home. Oh yeah, yeah, definitely. I don't, I don't. It's and where it's just like a small knit community here. You know, all my family's here, so. You know, I just I couldn't see myself leaving. What kind of family did you have? Oh man, so um, I had a wonderful, wonderful family. Um, I was raised a little kind of crazy. Um, I have always kind of come from chaos and, and violence, even as a little kid. Um, I've always been smaller, so my parents divorced when I was about three. Um, and so that kind of lifestyle of being shipped off to a different house 24-7. And, you know, I'd basically be at my mother's house, and it was very welcoming, warm, and loving. And then I'd go to my father's house, and it was party and chaos and, you know, crazy. So kind of really never knew which avenue to take, you know, and it just it traveled that way through the years. Um, you know, my dad was, he was rough. Love him. You know, I love my father. I think he's an amazing man. Um, and he's taught me a lot of life's lessons, but his way of teaching that was rough. Yeah. So, but I, I, at the end of the day, like, you know, I appreciate that. And then, you know, go to my mom's house. I have an awesome stepdad over there and he's came into my life when I was around four and he has never treated me different. And he, you know, a lot of times was a dad in places that I didn't have one and, you know, really, really guided me. And morals, how to treat people. Um, you know, he was a pastor, so he definitely tried to teach me uh, you know, the good yeah. fundamentals of life. Yeah, for sure. Yeah. Uh, what did your family structure look like? I know, I mean, obviously your parents were divorced at a young age for you. Do you have any siblings or anything like that? Yeah. <clears throat> so I actually have four brothers. Um, so we have two brothers that we have the same mom and different dads, and then I had two brothers with the same dad and different moms. Um, so I have four half brothers, but you know, but they're brothers. So. Are you the oldest? So that's it. No sisters, thank God. I, uh, my older brother, he passed away. He was the oldest. Uh, so uh, okay. The, the rest, yeah. okay. But I was pretty much I was pretty much the older brother with all that too. So. <laughs> <laughs> always, I bet. Always keeping him out of trouble. So I I don't really know what exactly it is you do for work. Now you put videos up of you acting dumb at work with your coworkers and making them feel uncomfortable yeah. and yeah. banging shit around. And you're in this huge <laughs> open office. And like the other day you did the, uh, uh, the queen song, we will rock you with the yeah. little. Doom, doom. Yeah. 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 What, what exactly do you do for work? If you don't mind um, me asking, don't tell so me now, where you work. Don't yeah, tell yeah. me where you work, but no, what good. do you you're do good. for work? Um, for now, um, what I do now is I was, Oh, I've always been built as a young child. My dad was a master carpenter. So he taught us how to build things, how to work with our hands. Um, so now I work for a company that I go to homes and residents, and I am what they call a solution specialist. So I go there, I see what is wrong with your home, and I discover and put together a plan and solution to fix that. Um, so I used to be in the production side where I actually went and done the work. I would build remodel bathrooms, waterproof basements push piers, stabilize foundations. Um, but they have now moved me to the side of being in the office. 
and going out and actually surveying the jobs and putting together the best solution on how to fix it. And I'm asking this question just because I already know that wasn't your first job, right? That wasn't the first thing you did before you got into this realm of what you do no, now. No. Uh, growing up through high school, uh, what did you want to do and what realm did you want to get into? So growing up through high school, um, you know, I, I had always done martial arts. And as a kid, I like loved Batman. I love superheroes just like every other little boy. Uh, Power Rangers was a huge thing. Um, so I always kind of wanted to do something just where I could like give back and, and help people with skills that, you know, God has graced me with. And fortunately, I'm graced very handily with, you know, with violence, honestly. Um, when I was 17, a girl that had been a very, very big impact in my life and a part of my life since I was a young, young child overdosed on morphine. And someone gave that to her at a party and you know, I never got to say bye to her. So from that day, I thought the thing I want to do is be a police officer. You know, I think if I can fight this war on drugs, help people who can't help themselves because I do, I just I freaking hate bullies. I hate them, you know, so. I thought, you know, if I can maybe do something to just make a difference in life, then that's what I'm going to do. So at 18 years old, after I graduated high school, I joined the police again and started my journey with that. How long did you, uh, obviously you're in a different realm of work now. So how long did you stay in the police force? So I was a police officer for eight years uh, in the most dangerous city where I'm from. Uh, a lot of people, they know where I'm at. They call it the West Side. So I was on the West Side for eight years. I quit about 26. I'm 31 now, and I did it from 18 to, to 26. Uh, so about eight years. That's yeah. cool. Well, the reason why I ask is I have had guests that have not had civil service experience. However, they were part of it in that they had friends or family or something to the effect that where it tied them to the civil service realm. Well, you were actually directly involved with it. A lot of a lot of the the what I like to share and um, what the main purpose of the podcast really was for is to show that everybody that does a civil service job, be it military, police, fire, EMS, whatever, that we're no more than any other human being. We are not superhuman. We are not heroes, or at least we don't regard ourselves as heroes. We appreciate the sentiment. We appreciate the sentiment, but we are not heroes because when people tell us that we feel like we have to live up to it sometimes. Oh right? yeah. Yeah. And it, yeah. And it, it, it kind of becomes to the point, like when, when they're like, man, like you are literally an angel to us, you know, that makes me feel like I can't ever break, makes me feel like I can't ever fall. And inside you have to kind of break and fall alone. You know, it's like, that's a lot of where that video came from. You know, I felt like, man, I'm doing all this stuff for everybody else, but when am I going to have my chance to just let, loose yeah so you know it's just everybody needs to understand that we make mistakes too and we are human too and just because i had a badge and a gun doesn't mean i'm better than anybody else it just means that i'm here for a purpose you know and it's okay for me to fail as well we've taken away second chances in life yeah we have and the thing about that i the way i like to uh explain it and i told you this already before is that we're normal people that chose to do an abnormal job, Absolutely. right? But just because we made that choice and continue to make that choice to do that abnormal job does not mean we are any better at dealing with tragedy than anybody else. We still get affected yeah. by it. Granted, it may not be our own personal tragedy, right? But when you become a part of that story of somebody else's tragedy, no matter how big or small, you are now part of a tragedy and that can affect yes. you. It can yeah. affect you. Why, if you don't mind me asking, why did you end up leaving the police force? Well, so I got also got married at 19 years old. Um, and dun, dun, it dun. caused such yeah, yeah, right. <laughs> it caused it caused such a rift between me and my family because I basically became a shell of myself. Um, there was a lot of corruption 
in the police department. And it was getting to the point, man, I would just wake up and look in the mirror and did not recognize what was looking back. And I really, really, like, I think for me, one of the worst things that I've ever heard and that still haunts me to this day is from my mom. And she said, I don't recognize my son anymore. She's like, what happened to my laughing, happy son? She's like, I don't recognize this person. She's like, you don't speak, you don't talk. You, know, you go home, you get on your motorcycle, that's it. No one ever sees you. It caused a bad divorce. Um, you know, also we got married too young. But, you know, it just was one of those things that I was 26 years old and I had lived a life that most have never seen in their entire life. And I had seen things that most people should not have seen to be 26 years old. And I got in this such a mode that I could not ever be just relaxed. It was constant tension and battle all the time. And I just kind of felt like everyone was always out to get me, you know, because people hated you just because you wore that gear. But they never took five minutes just to get to know me. You know, so there was some rift in between me and the police department, and I didn't want to do certain things. Um, and not saying that they wanted me to do anything bad. It's just, you know, I'm, I'm not a ticket writer. I, I don't. You know, I didn't go out and just to make a stat. I didn't want to arrest people unless it was absolutely necessary. I thought, you know, I'm a public servant and I would rather help you through this process rather than just writing you a ticket because you're probably having a hard time paying your bills anyways. And I just, there was just a lot of things that just didn't sit well with me. And I decided to resign and bow out and move forward and do something else with that. When you bowed out, did you start uh, working on yourself? Uh, working on the because when we get into this field right i don't know how it happens but it happens we train our minds and our hearts to almost get a little callous right in that when when a call drops it becomes a job right we almost have to dehumanize it a little bit because if we went into it emotional, we can we can either make a bad situation worse or we might not see something we need to see. We might miss something when when we go into those situations emotional and not based on our training and logic. It can end up bad, not only for us, but for the people we're we're there to help. So we learn this reactive training like second nature training right and even though we are helping a person it's where we have steps to do in a job that we've been trained to do and it's not until after the call winds down all the chaos winds down that we go oh fuck we just went through that or it's like all right what's for lunch (laughs) <laughs> you know, like yeah. we can just forget yeah. about it, mm-hmm. you know, no big deal. And it, it's not saying that we don't care. It's just, it's a coping mechanism, you know? It's how you survive. Uh, yeah. I saw a video. It was funny. It was people in civil service are selective psychopaths in that, <laughs> in that, in that we can turn off our empathy to get the job done. Right. But then we can turn it back on once yeah. the job is over. So we're selective exactly. psychopaths. We're selective sociopaths. We, you know, we get we have learned how to yeah. turn off our empathy so we can do the job that needs to be done because yeah, that's what we want to do. We want to help, but we know that if we go wanting to help on a completely emotional level, it can be detrimental. So we rely on our training. We turn off the empathy. That call becomes a job. It's a patient. Here's the steps. This is a suspect. This is not a person. You know, stuff like that. And it's hard to explain to people that sometimes that's hard to turn off even when you go home. Oh, yeah. We we forget that we, we allow the training that has allowed us to deal with stress on the job. And we go home and there's stress at home, whether it be the dishes weren't done or bills or uh, you said something that 
pissed your wife off or your kid, something, whatever, right? We treat that stress like we treat the stress on the job. Exactly. It, it's no longer, it's no longer, here's this person having this emotional issue. It's, all right, here's a problem. Let me fix it. Once it's fixed, let's go. Mm -hmm. We, we yep. almost disregard the emotion. We don't allow it to sit. We don't allow it to process. And we forget to turn off the training at home. And it can cause issues. It yeah. does cause issues. It causes big right. issues. Yeah. Yeah, it really does. For me, it was like, you know, especially my wife now, amazing woman, but our biggest gap between each other is communication and handling things in life. You know, for me, the sky could be falling down right now. And I know this is going to be my last moment, but I'm going to go, cheers, Josh, man. It was nice talking to you. You know, I'll see you on the other side. For them, just because the water bill is five days past due, it is detrimental to them. It's like they, you know, normal people in normal life, they, they don't handle stress like us. You know, so. Well, I it's a different stress. That, it's yeah, a different yeah, stress. But, it's like, but at the same time, I look at that stress and I'm like, I've seen way worse. I don't care. <laughs> right. Know? That's all you're dealing with? Like, okay. You know, so you have to kind of learn that what might be big to me might be small to you. But what might be small to you might be big to me. So you have to learn to put yourself in everyone's shoes that we all handle things different. When I started really learning that, it, it, it did change my perspective a lot. So I recently been diagnosed with severe de uh, depression, uh, anxiety, and PTSD. And of course, to top it all off, I have ADHD because who doesn't like to hyper focus on all the yeah. What could possibly go wrong <laughs> shit in their life, you know, somebody with ADHD. Oh, yeah. So I recently was diagnosed with that. And so I wanted to get better. I made the choice to get better. There was a situation that happened that I was like, I cannot let this situation happen again. I need to start. That. I finally realized that there was something wrong. And through this research, I have found that in regards to what we were talking about when it comes to stress, right? Obviously, Obviously, we know there is a level to stress in that severe stress, moderate stress, low stress. But the difference between all those stresses is the person that labels them, right? That's the difference. But our brains do not know the difference. We react to stress no matter what it is. Stress is stress, right? Our brains fire the same way no matter what the stress is. So somebody that's worrying about the water bill five days late, right, has the same brain synapses as us worrying about going into a situation where we might, you know, get hurt. It's still stress. The brain, you know, it, it doesn't know the difference between the stresses. And when I learned that, I was like, wow. That that hits. It makes me realize that I was downplaying the stresses at home, right? I was saying I was putting yeah. what I considered my level of high stress to be nothing compared to the people around me, right? Be it like right. their level of high stress is that's nothing to me, but it doesn't matter because yeah. biologically the brain's still firing the same way. Stress is stress. And when I yeah. finally realized that it, it it allowed me to really be empathetic to the people in my life and the problems that they had, either with me or like me and my wife, uh, you know, we have money stresses. We worry about them the same way now. And we understand that, you know, this is still something we have to take care of or or, you know, going on a date night or just talking, whatever. You know, we understand yeah. now that those stresses are the same. And and they're this they might not have the same level to me but i understand now that it reacts the same way right right and once i realized that i was able to be more empathetic whereas before yeah. the job and what i trained my mind to deal with when it came to empathy and stress i had to shut off yeah it, it's like for me it's like i i treated my family like i did the people that i dealt with at work it's like I couldn't shut off, like I couldn't shut them off from that. So when I got into a situation at home, 
I treated them as if I was dealing with them on the street. And it was like, I could not bridge the gap on how do I treat my family like family. At that point, it became, again, back to survival. Oh, you're in this stressful situation. Let me treat you like I would someone that I had just dealt with in the police department. And I couldn't separate that. You know, just like you, when I, when I learned that, hey, I don't have to keep that shut off all the time. Like, this isn't the same situation. Like, my family's not trying to harm me. You know, it, it changed the whole aspect and, and helped me learn to treat them, you know, and let myself open up and be able to be a part of their lives as well, instead of being so cut off to everybody. And you you hit on something earlier where you said something about communication being the biggest issue right now, right? But I think, I think really the biggest issue always is communication. It's yeah, always yeah, communication. Right. It's either we feel like what we're feeling or what we have to say isn't as important or how we're feeling doesn't matter in a certain situation where our headspace is, is our headspace. So why do I have to share it? You know, whatever the, whatever the thought process is on it, we forget that if, when we don't allow people to know where we're at, anybody, coworkers, family, your wife, your kids, your parents, if you don't tell them, they're going to see the difference. And they're not going to have any reasoning behind it. And then you start losing the reasoning in yourself. You don't understand why. Because you're not talking about it. You're not even talking about it with yourself. You're not even realizing it yourself. So communication, not only with yourself and being retrospective and, and really trying to figure out why you are the way you are, is probably the first and most important conversation you need to have is the conversation within yourself and yeah. then telling people this is a conversation you're having with yourself let them know where you're at that way they can better have, understand better help right have you ever like got the question and i know i've got this before and with myself they'll be like hey man you've been okay lately you've been acting a little different and then you sit and have to question yourself yeah, something's wrong with me, but I don't know what it is. Like, it's almost like you're set. like, man, what is wrong with me right now? Like, I'm not being my normal everyday self. So then you have trouble communicating to them what's wrong with you because you don't even know what's wrong with you yourself. And it's just, it's like this constant roller coaster of like, it's like an onion. It's peeling off of layer after layer after layer. And it's like, you can't ever get to the center. And it's, I think you're 100% right. If you would sit down and have that talk with yourself and communicate with yourself more. It would make it easier to be able to communicate with other people. Right. And there's there's this thing in in mental health science that has shown that the more you talk about it, either with yourself or with others, the more you actually put it out into the world, either you're you're writing it down in a journal. What I like to do is I'll make videos whenever I'm starting to have a feeling or an episode of depression or anxiety. I make a video myself. I'm not good with uh, writing down. It takes too long because my thoughts just run way too fast. Sometimes my thoughts run faster than my words. So if I try to write it down, it, yeah. it wouldn't work. So what I'll do is I'll video myself and I'm literally looking at myself and I'm talking to myself. This is blah, 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 blah. I'm, I'm concerned about this. I'm excited about this. I'm, I'm sad about this, blah, blah, blah. And I, I just unload. And then I'll go back. As soon as I'm done, I'll go back and I'll watch it immediately. Once I feel like I got everything out, I watch it immediately. And then my, I, I let my emotion out, right? So my emotions, I'm watching my emotions play out. And now I'm able to use my logical mind in saying, well, that doesn't make sense because you can do this. Well, this thing you're concerned about doesn't really exist right now so let's let's figure out some and that's what it that's what works for me is i video myself i talk to myself other people will talk to themselves in the mirror and well that's crazy you're crazy what no (laughs) it's not it's actually very healthy to put your emotions out and not keep them in and then it's even more healthier to actually start sharing your story with other people especially the people that are closest to you so they understand where you're at, where your mind space is at. 
then they can better understand when they see you in a down place, they know why. And they're not get you're not getting that question. Are you okay? Are you okay? Well, let me tell you before you even ask the question. No, I'm not okay. I don't know what's wrong. I'm trying to figure that out right now. Okay, cool. Is there anything I can do? Instead of going, yeah, I'm fine. That that yeah. that's the most that's common the, that's answer. That's the typical answer. Yeah. yeah. No, I'm fine. I'll be fine. I'll be fine. Yeah. Well, no. You, I always I always say I'm good. Right. But obviously, you know, you're lying to them and to yourself. And exactly. if you say if you say, oh, I'll be fine or I'll be okay. Well, really, you really don't know because you're not a fortune teller. One. Right. Right. You don't know. You want to be fine later on. You can say that. You can say. I want to be okay later on, but right now I'm not, you know, we have to change the language. We have to change the language, I think is one of the biggest things that we have to do when it comes to our mental health. Obviously I got you on the show because you are a huge PTSD advocate, mental health advocate for what you're doing on your platform, on your TikTok and on your other platforms. And I I really, really like, we're going to get into, uh, before that, I'm going to, I'm going to back up a little bit. Okay. Uh, I, 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 it's my ADHD. I'm sorry. Oh, dude, trust me. Same way. <laughs> people, people are listening to this podcast and they're like, he was about to go into something. Wait, he's going back. Well, squirrel moment. Sorry. <laughs> yeah. <It's cool. laughs> yeah. Um, when you got out of the PD department, when did you realize you needed to start working on yourself with that? Was it shortly thereafter? Was it a couple, like, when did it, when did you actually start realizing fuck, I need to, I need to start working on me now because I am not even giving myself a hundred percent. And how the hell am I going to give the people in my life a hundred percent right now? I'm giving them, um, I'm giving them the 50% that is okay. And yeah. I'm not giving them all of me because there's this 50% here that nobody knows about. I don't even know about, I'm sad. I'm angry. I'm upset, whatever, but I'm not sharing these things. When did you realize, fuck, I need to start sharing this shit. Dude, it was a long time. Um, when I got, when I quit the police department, I got worse. I didn't get better. I actually went into a, like a very, very bad spiral. Uh, drinking all the time. Uh, I was single. I was just running around partying in bars, girls, I mean, you name it. I, I just, other than drugs, man, I, I was just basically doing anything to see how far I could push the limits to try to feel something. Because I was just so dead. So I would get flights. I'd take that motorcycle and get up to 160, 70, just let go of handlebars. Anything to try to get my mind to almost like jolt myself back into reality. And it just kept getting worse. And you know, then I, I met my wife now. And, you know, it was literally just one of those things where I just wanted to you know, hang out the girl and take her home and, you know, When I met her, I told her, I was like, hey, I'm pretty damaged. Like, I'm not looking to date anyone, and I've been through a lot, I've seen a lot, and I've done a lot. I'm just trying to have fun and just do me. And really what I was doing was was trying to find any kind of emotion anywhere, because I was so dead to everything. And she looked at me, and she said, I can't ever hold against you anything that you've ever done. Where you met me. She's like, I can only judge you on what you do now and in the future. And it just kind of grew from there. But that is one amazing woman to have the wherewithal to know that. Yeah. And, and she has very, very badly struggled with understanding me, but she's never gave up trying to understand me. And I think for me, I stayed in this rut, I stayed in this constant signal of myself of like old me it's gone i'm done uh, this is just me now i'm a shell of myself and i'm always going to be surrounded by violence and chaos it's just what it's always going to be and i almost lost my family and we actually ended up separating i was just doing dumb stuff man. i was not my character you know i just wasn't being the person that i was raised to be and I wasn't being the person that I was meant to be and I kept like shoving everything just farther farther down and it's I kind of make it think of like a backpack man you can only shove so much in a backpack 
until it starts to kind of overflow. And, you know, I just trying to zip that thing open until that thing just burst. So I was faced with two options and I was either get help, figure myself out or lose my family. And I thank God have an amazing support system with my wife and my family. And I turned around and, and made a big, big jump. And I'm not ever going to sit here and say I'm 100% okay because none of us ever are. And if you say that, you're lying to yourself. But the difference is I am making a point to get to being better and you know, understanding myself just as much as she can try to understand me. And it really did not happen until about a year ago that I actually sat down and start saying something's got to get you know, I've, I've got to start talking about this because I just would hold it so much in. But it was so strange too. I mean, I talked to a complete stranger about my entire life and I would never have to see them again. But when I come to the people that I loved, I was even hesitant to tell them what I had for breakfast that day. It's just like every part of my life felt so secretive all the time. Do you and, think, you know, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry to stop you, but do, oh, you, you, think, do you think part of that was because you left the job. Now, yeah. the reason why I ask that is because when we're in the job, right? And I've had this conversation before. We almost, whenever there's stresses at home, we almost want to just go back to work, right? Yeah. Because yeah. that's the stress we know how to handle. That's the stress where our coping mechanism works, mm -hmm. right? Safe. We feel I'm comfortable. Safe. We're safe. We know how to handle it. We know what to do. It works for us. It makes us feel normal. And so when we have stresses anywhere else outside of that, and we don't have that place to go to anymore where we can be the thing we've always been to handle that stress, I, I can't, I, I mean, until recently, right, before I, I probably could never imagine not being able to go do that do the job because the job was more than just a job. It was a way of life. It was a way for me to cope. It was a way for me to deal. And when you leave that for whatever reason, you're leaving a, what was a coping mechanism for yourself. Honestly, I think it was more detrimental to me than staying. Um, it was almost like I was Superman and I lost my powers. You know, and then I, I, I was so vulnerable and trying to navigate it to a normal lifestyle. And now, looking back on it, I wouldn't be where I'm at today had I not left. I would have not met my wife. I wouldn't have my daughter. So I do count those blessings. But leaving that job, it left me so unsure of everything and vulnerable to every part of my life because I didn't have that escape. So I knew, like, if something was going on in my life, I was going to go to work. I was going to get in that police car. I was going to take 911 calls. My adrenaline was going to be jacked to the roof. I'm going to be listening to Metallica at a high speed chase. You know, it was like that was my safe place and my giveaway. Also, I lost my guys. I lost the people who understood me. Not saying that I can't call them right now and say, I need someone to talk to, but I lost that support system that was around me 24 7. I spent more time with the guys on that police department than I did my entire family. I spent more time with them every single day. I had intimate moments with them. I had life and death scenarios with them 24-7. So they became my brothers, my support, and everyone that I would look to for advice. Also, the biggest one that I felt was they understood me, and they understood what I was going through because they were there with me. So when you have that all ripped away and taken away from you, you don't you feel so alone and vulnerable that you basically harbor it all inside yourself. And it became even worse as if I would have stayed than when I left. And, you know, it just, it, it did something to me. And I, to this day, I don't really understand why it is that way. But it's like I lost everything that I was when I set that badge back. I personally have a theory and think that it's because it was a part of our life and part of our coping. It was a part of a family that understood us because they were in the shit with us, right? They, they, they can 
under, they might not feel the exact same way about it, but they understand yeah. why you were feeling a certain way about it. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like yeah. that was, that's what it is. It's, it's the same thing in the fire department. It's the same thing in the military. You hear about the guys that come back from, you know, Afghanistan or Iraq, and they just, they can't wait to go back because home life, they don't know how to deal with the stresses of home life. The stresses of home life are, I mean, in their heads, it's nothing. I mean, when yeah. yeah, the laundry wasn't yeah. done, who the fuck cares? The laundry wasn't <laughs> fucking done. Yeah. Well, it, that's a stress. That's somebody, that's somebody else's stress. And you should be empathetic to that stress, but you can't be because your mind has been rewired and retrained nope. to think about the things for you at that time were extremely important. Like, I don't know, not getting shot. Or going into a situation that could yeah. be life-threatening, you know? And so when you come back home and you don't, you're not having that same uh, triggers, I guess, so to speak. You're not having that same adrenaline yeah. that you alluded to earlier. It, it's you, you lose that sense of, well, fuck, well, then am I really the person I am or was I part or was I the job or was I a product of what happened because of the job? And then you just lose yourself. Right. Because that was I, you. And I think point. another, it, it was, I think a huge factor for me is I also joined that at 18 years old. So for my adult life, even now that I'm 31, my adult life, I have spent more as a police officer than not. So well, it's and, like I, at a, as a, I was a kid, man. You know. And well, science shows that your mind doesn't completely develop until you're 26, 27 years old anyway. So while you're going through not only the life no. change of getting into a career, right? You're going through this whole life change and brain development of getting into a career. You're getting into a career that's high stress, right? It, it's, it's high, uh, uh, anxiety it's high risk and so now your mind is literally forming itself around these things because you are still your mind is still developing it's still becoming what it's going to yeah. be so you yeah. are now making these almost they're, they're not permanent by the way uh, recent science shows that we can actually change our neurotransmitters with therapy and, you know, uh, mental health drugs and stuff like that, which, by the way, I'm an advocate for uh, not abusing them, but using them in accordance with uh, the way they're supposed to be used and in step with th uh, therapy. Uh when you're able to do those things, you can actually rewire your neurotransmitter. It's just not into, just a couple of years ago. This has been something that scientists have been able to find out that we have the power oh, yeah. to rewire yeah. our brains to work like a quote unquote normal person. And when I say normal, I mean by like yeah. the masses, the the eighty five percent of people that yeah. don't have yeah. these issues, right? That that's what's considered normal. Uh, yeah. nobody's the same. When I say normal, it's just the general idea. I'm thinking of it statistics wise. So yeah. you get through all this and you finally realize something's going on. And just about a year ago, you figure out, Hey, I got to do something. Uh, I need to fix whatever the hell's going on. What steps did you take? If you don't mind me asking to, to start that process. Yeah. So the biggest step that I took, um, was first off, I set my family down and I said, here's what I'm going to do. And I think, and dude, it, I struggled, like even it was probably an hour long conversation. I sat my mom, my dad, and my two younger brothers down. And I said, this is, this is what's wrong with me. This is what I deal with every day. I don't know how to explain it to you, but this is what I'm feeling in my mind to an extent. And I don't know what to do. And they said, listen, and they, you know, the, the one thing I'll always say is my family's never judged me, you know, so, you know, I, I had to tell them, I told them very small, minute parts of what I had seen and done and said, you know, you guys think that it was just a job. It, it was not just a job. I lost myself. I, 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 
and I, and I told him at that point, I don't know who I am <laughs> right now. I don't know who I'm going to be tomorrow. And I, it scares me. And for the first time in my life, I think I hit myself with reality that I was scared and I didn't know who I was and I didn't know where I was going because at that point I didn't want to live. Either. So, you know, I, I just, but I had seen what suicide had done to my family. So I, that didn't feel like that was an option. But at the same time, I felt like that was my only option. So it's like, you're, you're battling with so much in your mind all the time. You're like this, you know, and that's why I, that's why my slogan is NATO. It's not an option, but at the same time, for some of us, it's the only option that I feel is okay. So you're, it's, it's a roller coaster. And after I sat and talked to them, um, you know, I, I sat down and had a like long conversation with my wife and, and talked with her. And I said, all I can do is tell you that I do anything I can to try and be better and, and, and you know, move forward and heal from this. And so, I, and I'll talk to certain, you know, therapists in my life, uh, whether it be a pastor or, you know, a professional or anything like that. And I opened up to my friends and I honestly just started living life. I, I stopped being so close to myself right now and communicating better, answering the phone more, calling friends more, and just getting out there instead of feeling in a turtle show 24 7. I mean, it's still going. I, I'm still, still struggling with that. So for me, what it sounds like is you, you were struggling with depression, obviously. Uh, yeah. And because yeah. when you said, when you, you just said it. You said you didn't know who you were, and you don't know who you're going to be. That was one of my biggest fears too. Is going through this yeah. process of getting better. Well, who is the better me? Who is that? I, I don't. Yeah. I don't know who that is, and it's scary. Is the better me somebody it that scary. it is? Is the better me somebody that loves? The people I love now is the better me, you know, still passionate about the things I'm passionate now, or am I passionate about the things I'm passionate now because the broken part of me dictated that? I don't know. Yeah. I don't, and it's scary, yeah. right? And we don't know. But I, I challenge the idea that the first step was talking to your parents. I think the first step was you talking to yourself and admitting it to yourself. Yeah. And then the it, second yeah. step was letting your family know. Yeah. And I, I basically, I, I woke up and I, I looked in the mirror because I spent many, many nights here in this house alone. You know, my, my wife went and she was living with her mom at the time. It was probably the most scariest thing being in a closed place with nothing but yourself. So I was forced to do nothing but have a conversation with myself. And that's, you know, you're right. That, I did. I had to sit down and, with myself and really come to terms and go, oh, what are you doing? Like, this is not what we are designed to do. Like, you're better than this. And, you know, then it just slowly kept coming out from there until, you know, I did talk to, talk to my family and friends and a lot of that, like, yeah, I'm screwed. <laughs> like, I'm screwed up, you know? And the thing is, it's a constant process. There, there's, it is. It, it is. It, it's a constant process. It's a constant battle. Uh, but it can get better. That's the thing. We just have to make the choice to do the things to make it better. You alluded to earlier when you were talking about your options and what you felt your options were um, and suicide uh, directly. Uh, you alluded to the effect that you have seen the effects that it can have on your family. And I was wondering if you'd be comfortable enough to share what you meant by that. Yeah. Um, so dude, I'm an open book, man. You can ask me anything. Um, so after I quit the police department, um, I had an older brother who had served, um, a couple of tours in Iraq and Afghanistan and he had drove over an ID and, had lost a good chunk of his leg and was sent to Germany to heal. So I didn't see my brother for a while. And when he was in Germany, his entire platoon almost did not make it. Um, so he was left bedridden, stuck in that bed while his family was still in Iraq fighting that war and they didn't come home. So my brother came home and, you know, we talked a lot and I had my home front war and he had his overseas war and, and we would talk about it without talking about it, if that makes sense. 
And I get it. I, you know, we both kind of lived this crazy life and we didn't get to have a relationship with our father uh, as kids that we really wanted to. So I started a construction business for me, my dad and my brother to be able to work together and have that kind of relationship as adults that we didn't get to have as kids. And, you know, my brother had gotten into some trouble. Um, he just couldn't kind of cope with everything. So he was kind of like on a house arrest, but was allowed to work, um, you know, sort of thing. And I noticed that he had been kind of acting a little different. And I noticed the signs because I've seen those same signs within myself. But I also just kind of went back to the point of, he'll be fine. We survived this is for you. So Friday night, um, we were getting ready to end the week of work and we were putting together this bed for a customer of ours because we were remodeling this house. It's weird to sit back and think on this. I haven't really thought about this conversation in a long time, but he was trying to put the bed together wrong and we got into the stupidest argument that you could ever possibly get into. And we were literally screaming in each other's face about putting this bed together. And both of us are kind of chaotic and violent by nature. So we're like literally about to fist fight in this dude's house. And we're both like in each other's faces. He's throwing tools. I'm throwing tools. Or, I mean, I'm threatening to beat his ass and he's threatening to beat mine. And he turns around and he says, do it yourself. And he gets in his car and he drives off. And I was like, whatever, I'll just put together the bed and you can go home. And well, I don't know, I just don't give a shit or whatever. So Saturday, and I didn't hear anything from him. So he calls me that Sunday, and I don't answer the call. I was kind of still pissed off at him. I was like, I just don't really want to talk to you right now. And I was dealing with some other things. So I was like, I'll just call him back. And they're shooting a text, whatever. But I never called him, and I never texted him back, and he never tried to call me again, so I was like, I'll just see him at work. So, Monday morning, I show up to work, and my dad shows up to work, and 9 o'clock starts rolling around, and my brother still has it. And, you know, you kind of get those, like, weird little instincts and hair standing up on the back of your neck, like, this isn't normal, something's wrong. It's like a feeling just, your training, again, kind of takes over, and you're like, something's not right. But we kept calling him and texting him, um, thinking, you know, maybe he's just doing something with court. Maybe he just overslept. Lunchtime rolls around. We go down to drive to his apartment. Open the door, kick the door open, and find that he uh, had took his life the night before. And immediately, like, the only thing that I can, like, I can still hear it in my head. It's just like my dad screaming. Like, that's the thing that I remember the most about going into that apartment is just the screaming of my dad. And, you know, it was in my city where I was a police officer. So it's like, I did, I immediately went back into survival. mode. Cut the door off. Everyone get out. Secure the scene. Let's see what's going on. You know, it's like I didn't have a chance to even break down at that point. It's like I never shed a tear. And it's like my brain went, you've been here a hundred times. You have found this same scenario a hundred times. It's time to put the badge on. It's time to be the cop again. Get your shit together and figure out what's going on. So that's that's where I went. And it's like I never got the chance really to even bask in that moment or even like let in what was even happening because of my training again took over all those years of doing this for seven, even though that's my own brother laying right there, my mind took him to just another day on the job. And even though I had been out of that job for a couple of years, it took me back to this is how you're going to survive. It's time to move into that moment. And then all those other police officers that I had worked for all those years showed up. And it put me back into that mode, the mode that I had worked so hard to get out of and to let that part of that career of my life not go fully, but to be able to move on to another chapter. It didn't reset my entire book back to the first page. And I, I got even worse after that. And it's just like every time I would just like 
want to just be normal is like put your put your cop back on and you know it's time to go back in survival mode handle this like you do everything else i immediately started i went through everything i was like i want to i want cameras i want to know who was in this apartment i want to know what was going on you know and it's just even though like deep down i knew he committed suicide i didn't want I had to make sure that every aspect of that place had been looked over by me. And, you know, I had to know that I didn't miss it. And I seen like what that effect had on my dad. And my dad did not have us a whole lot as kids. So the second that he got us back, the second that he got to really be a father, he got taken away from him. And then he knew at that point he can never, ever, ever try that again. And it just, it caused such a rift in my family, but it also, the time that it really should have brought us together, it actually ripped us apart even worse. And I struggled with what ifs. If I had just answered that fucking phone that night, I thought back to that conversation. That the last conversation that I ever had with him was, I'm going to beat your ass in this dude's house over building a bed. And it's like, you sit there and you second guess all the times that you gave up to hang out with him, all the times that you didn't call and check on him. Could I have said something? Could I have done something? Why did I see the damn signs that I see in my fucking self every day and I just humble my little ass enough to just drive down there and check on him? Because if I would have done that, maybe he would have still been alive. And those are the voices, I think, that echo in my head all the time with my inner demons. You have saved so many people in your life. I've saved so many people that I can't even count, whether it was on that department or in real life as a civilian, but I couldn't save the one that mattered the most. And it's something that haunts you. It haunts you forever. But again, like you're not allowed to break because your training takes you back to survival mode. Handle it. Bury it deep. Shut it off. Shut the empatheticness off even for yourself. And it just becomes such a struggle every day. And then you bleed that over into your normal life and you bleed that over into your, your wife, into your mother, into your daughter. And you cut them off again because that's where you're safe. That's where you're protected. You know, I know that if I let that floodgate down, that flood is going to, you know, demolish anything that it comes in contact with. So I keep those floodgates up to keep me from allowing to do that. And that was at that time because that's when I started to get even worse and I became even more of a shell of myself. And I never really sat down and thought, what can I do to mend and heal from this? I never gave myself a chance to do that. I still really had not gave myself the chance to mend for my brother. I haven't shed a tear over my brother because it's my training. It's what I was taught to do. Don't show emotion. It's the stigma that you talk about. You're a man. Don't do it. This is how you get past it. And that's what I want to break because I almost lost my family over it. I almost lost myself over it. I almost lost my daughter over it. You know, so at what point do you say enough is enough? Let that floodgate down and see how it's going to affect everything else. You know, things don't grow in the sun. They grow, they grow because of rain. You have to go through a storm sometimes in your life to grow. And man, all trees are huge now at this point. And, you know, I, I think for me, a lot of that, too, was uncharted territory. My family had never been through it. I had never been through it. So that's where, like, a lot of my my content came from because I didn't have anyone to help me navigate through that. I had no one. I had people that say, I'm here for you. If you need anything, let me know. But no one gave me the tools to navigate through what I was going through. So I had to make my own tools. I had to make my own strategies and my own scenarios to be able to do that. And so many people in this world are going through something. And it's easy for me to tell you not to quit. It's easy for me to tell you to keep going. It's easy for me to tell you that I want you here. But what am I doing to keep you going and giving you the tools to be able to do that? And it, that's that was a big gap between everything. It's like, I had so many friends and family reach out to me. Hey, man, let me know if you need anything. Dude, I don't even know what I need. Okay, someone tell me how to survive this. Someone show me the path that I need to go to get through this because I don't know and it's fucking killing. So I started getting darker and darker and darker and darker. Um, And it just it came to the point like I did not see any light in the tunnel. So I got drunk one night and I was like, you know what? He got to do it. He got to just. Let all his pain go and leave us. I want to do that too. That's not fair. 
if you get to go, I get to go. And I grabbed my gun. I hopped on his motorcycle. And I drove to his grave site, drunk as shit, sat on his grave site. And for whatever reason, I always have a roundup in my chamber. I did not have a roundup in the chamber. And I went to rack that gun, and being a drunk dumbass that I was, it jammed. And the, the casing got stuck because I racked it too slow. And as soon as I racked it, I went to finish. On top of my brother's gravesite. That's how I, that's to the point that I was at that point. And dude, when that happened, man, it was like I felt all the pain of my family that had seen this from him. That all we went through, and I, man, I gun still up there somewhere. I threw that gun as far as I could throw it. Got on that motorcycle, drove back home. I slept in my basement, rolled back up. And I was just like, I will never, ever try that again. You know, God saved me one time. Might not get a say. All the stuff that I've survived and lived through, all the times that I have had someone try to kill me, I'll be damned if I'm going to let me be the one that kills me. So, you know, it, I, that's when I say I seen what struggles that that went through from a family and what suicide does. I seen what it did to myself, but I also seen what it done to my family. And then I seen what telling my family of me almost doing it just did to me. And no matter what, I will carry every bit of pain that I ever have to carry to keep someone else to have to live and carry and experience the pain that I do. Um, you know, I looked, I, I, I just did a lot of soul searching after that, and I didn't, I just didn't know what. So a good friend of mine called me and he said, I need you to go survey some property. And this is all within about a three month time span. So I traveled to New Orleans to survey some property for a friend of mine. After I got done with that work, I went down to Bourbon Street. I'd never been to New Orleans. I didn't know what New Orleans was about. So I went down there. I quit. Yeah, dude, it's crazy. I quit drinking. It's nuts. I, I wasn't drinking and I wanted to try out. And so I went down there and ate at this restaurant. And I was walking back to my hotel because my phone had died. So I didn't have a way to call like for an uber and two dudes i had noticed been following me and you know once you notice someone following you you don't unnotice right and those two guys tried to rob me uh i got stabbed four times in my stomach and my chest and you know did what i had to do to survive at that point made it back to the other side called an ambulance woke up handcuffed to the bed um i had several stitches in my chest and my stomach. Luckily, they had missed everything that was important, and I didn't you know, you know, die. They were able to get to me in time. So then that happened. Um, and I remember just kind of like sitting there, and it was the anniversary of Katrina. I remember just sitting there in the rain falling down. And I remember just how peaceful that was. You know, But again, that surviving mentality and that fighter made me get back up and go. So when I come back home, and I told my wife, this is what happened. I didn't want to freak her out. She said, well, I'm glad you're okay because I'm pregnant. And that's how I found out when I was having my little girl. And I just remembered like that very peaceful feeling in the rain. So that's why we ended up naming my little girl Rain. And I just sat back and thought, man, if I'd have been successful that night that I went and tried to commit suicide, or if I would have gave up that night when those two thugs tried to rob me, I wouldn't have the greatest gift that I've ever gotten to have. And that was my little girl. You know, everything kind of happens in life for a reason. And I didn't know what my purpose was. I still don't know, but you know, I'm going to figure it out. And it's, I'm going to help people navigate through those situations that I didn't help have helped to navigate through. That's when I say I understand what suicide does to a family. That's why I understand. Uh, I can only say uh, thank you for sharing that and allowing us to be a part of that and to be privy to that part of your life. It's very hard sometimes to really admit, not only to ourselves, but to anybody else that we go through these things, right? It's easy. Let me, let me rephrase that. It's easy to say, yeah, uh, my, my brother committed suicide. Yeah, I got jumped and I fought back. You know, it's, it's easy to say those things because those are just the things that happened. What's hard to talk about is the feelings that came along with 
those things. Yeah. That's the hard part. The hard part yeah, is, is how did it make you feel? How did it change your life? How did you process it? Did you process it? Did you not? Did you cry? Did you not? Like all the all the other things that get tied to the action, that's the hard part. Yeah. You you keep saying you're still fighting. And you're still looking for your purpose. And you're still, even, even though you're going through this process and going through this journey in your life, you're still willing to help other people that may be on the back half of what you went through the journey, right? They might be on that beginning steps of what that journey that you've already been through. Granted, everybody handles stress and tragedy and emotion differently. Saying you understand is how you should say it. You should not say, I know how you feel, right? Yeah. We don't, we want to be know. very careful. Yeah, exactly. We don't know how you feel. We can understand in that we've been through a similar situation so we can understand the emotions that are typically tied to those things but we do not know how you feel we can't say oh man i know how you feel about that this happened well no you don't know how it feels because i'm me that was my brother not your brother that was you know it's a completely different situation as you're going through this journey ryan you decided at some point to make your social media platform, your TikTok, right? You, you did it on a dare, but then you found a purpose for it. And you, it, you haven't looked back. I mean, it's been two months and your, your, your family, I don't like to call them followers, right? Yeah. I mean, these are people that literally chose you they chose you they yeah. said what you are sharing and what you have to say is worthy of my time yeah. that's huge because time you can never get back time these people are spending even if it's 15 to 30 seconds at a fucking time 60 seconds at a time doesn't matter they are giving their time to you their yeah. family they are friends when did you realize when you started making that content when did you realize that that's the content you wanted to go with? And then when did you realize it was bigger than you just making the content? It, it meant something more than just you expressing how you felt. So for me, when my brother passed and I, when I was sitting in that room with him, um, waiting for the whole process to be over, I made a promise to him that day. And promised to myself that day that I would try to do anything that I could to help people like me and him and help them navigate through that. But through all the trauma of everything, I didn't keep that promise. I, 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 I buried that deep down and I thought, nope, not letting this out, you know. So I put a video, um, and I've always kind of made little videos like that, but I never really pushed, um, so I made a video of me at my brother's gravesite, you know, having a beer with him. And I do that. Once a month, I go up there to my brother's gravesite. He had a love Bud Light, so I'll sit and I will have a drink with him. And I'll open one for him and we'll sit and talk. And I'll just tell him about life. You know, what's going on? I just spent to him, whatever. And I struggled, like, putting that on there. And I thought, you know what? That's nah, too real. Like. There's so much stuff on this app. You know, you can shake your hand in for likes. And I support anything that you want to do on there. But there's so much more that can be done with the outreach of it. And I put that on there. And just the comments that started pouring into it and going, oh, my God, like, before I seen this, I was going to kill myself. Before I realized, like, what this does to somebody left behind, I already had it in my head. I would thank you for this video. And that's when it really kind of started resonating with me more that all, oh, like, here's my chance to keep my palms. So that's when I made the turn of my content to really start shutting out my experiences, my story, and what I go through to try to help others. So 
for me, when I finally made that decision to start sharing my story, it started reaching a lot of people as well. But for me, it almost stressed me the fuck out. Right? <laughs> Yo, it, that just, yeah. So we put it out there. And then you realize this feeling that you thought you were alone with. This feeling that you thought you could never have anybody completely understand. And they might not completely understand because they're not you. But there but is a it. similarity. There's mm -hmm. a commonality where those emotions are felt. We, we know what those emotions feel like. They might be a little bit different. Sure, the situation different. Sure. But holy fuck, I'm not alone in this. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm not as unusual or unique in this aspect that I thought. And a lot They're, of the people who said that, like, you know, I understand where you are at right now. I lost my brother six months ago, or I lost this fan number six months ago. It made me realize, it's like, oh, I'm not alone. Because I did, I felt very alone. And it made me understand, like, no, you don't know what I'm going through personally, but you get it. Like, that's the big one. You get it. Like, you've been in a similar situation. You get it. So, I mean, that, that's kind of like when it really started really striking out. For me, it was almost like I gained another family, like the fire department family. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Like the police family. You started gaining people in your life that understood, right? Like yeah. when you're on the job and you're around those people that understand how the job affects you, it's easy to talk to them. And so when you start putting out this content and for people to learn from and listen and feel from and they reach out, you're like, wow, I'm not alone anymore. Mm -hmm. I, I have I have people in my corner. Sure, they're not going to be able to throw the punches for me. They're not going to be able to fight the fight for me. But when I'm down, they, they're going to be there to lift me up they're in between the rounds. Right. They're going to lift yep. me up. They're going to put me in the corner and be like, hey, this is what I saw. Next time, when he throws that right jab, duck, you know, yeah. slip it to the left. Yeah. His, his solar place would be wide open for you to do a right hook. You know, I'm talking box. I used to box. I was amateur boxing. Yeah. So, yeah. so we we gained this support that we never knew was out there until we were vulnerable. And I say vulnerable in quotations because it's actually strength. We showed the strength of sharing what a lot of people tend to think of is taboo to share, right? The, yeah. the struggle, the brokenness, the sadness, the unknowing, the scared, you're just being scared. Yeah. And when you share that, it allows people, other people to be like, oh, wow, I'm not alone in this too. Yeah. And then it starts them on their journey. I appreciate everything you've put out. Uh, you're very, you're very, with your content, it's not just standing in one place. You're very uh, cinematic with your content, which is cool because it, it helps tell the story, right? You'll, you'll, you'll do a little part here. You'll travel somewhere else, do a little part there, but it all becomes one story. Other people do it other ways. Me, uh, I, I just, I don't know what it is, but for me, it's black and white with some good somber music in the background. And then me, like when I see myself like that, I'm able to just, that's like the alternate me. That's the me. Yeah. That's what I get to explain. That's when I get to share. You found a way to do it by telling a story through action, through you know, just being open and raw and you can feel it. You can tell that you are not creating this content on a whim. You can tell you really want to make sure what you want to say is being said. It's yeah. not, it's not like on a whim. Oh, I have this thought. Let me record it. It's you think out the process and the message you really are trying to tell. And I think that's huge because 
sometimes it needs to be a little bit more specific and not so general. Yeah. Sometimes. Yeah. And it's like, you know, and, I, and that video kind of blew up and then, you know, I made, and I like to do very meaningful videos and down to the nitty gritty, what PTSD does for me, uh, how I've survived it, what my inner demons say to me. But then I also want to post dumb things like singing in the office or dancing out in the street. If I only show negativity, and I only show you doom and gloom and threshing and PTSD and anxiety, but I don't show you another part of me, that's not going to give you any hope. If I show you, like, yeah, this is what I deal with, but I can still get out there to the middle of that street and dance on the hood of my coal. I still have a glimmer of happiness, but I, in between, I give you the tools to navigate through that and let you know you're not alone in what you're going through. Well, it, what you're doing is you're showing the human aspect of what depression, PTSD, anxiety is. It's yep. it's always there, but it's not always there, right? Right. There's the, that trend on tiktok where uh they say uh show us a point when you're at your lowest right and it's videos of people dancing and having a good time or it's pictures of them smiling with their friends and everything else but that's real because that's what it is depression is always there however for whatever reason our minds are able to either either the depression sits back and we'll be triggered either subconsciously or we'll see something and then that depression hits all of a sudden and that that happiness that we were showing it it was happiness but it was happiness that was kind of tainted in that we have that depression and anxiety and uh, PTSD and and yeah. sadness tied to it so even though we're happy and we are we do have those happy moments we do have we still have life we still have happy moments mm -hmm. we're still happy about mm -hmm. our kids our you know for you your daughter um and and we still have those blessings but sometimes when you have depression and stuff like that they almost feel like a little tainted because we still have to deal with what is a mental illness yeah and just because we're depressed yeah. doesn't mean that's what we are exactly just because you have a broken arm doesn't mean you're just a broken arm you know it, it's right. just it's an illness that's all it is yeah. we're still it's human. like a lot of people always say they're like man what makes you happy and it's like i sat down and i go oh well you know this makes me happy this makes me happy and then they say what keeps you happy and I'm like I'm, I'm not like every day isn't always happy <laughs> it's like that, like just because you like see these pictures of me and I have a smile on my face, you don't see the war that goes on inside, you know. And it's like they're like that's one of the biggest things. I was like, man, he seemed like he was fine. I can't believe he committed suicide. I'm like, on the outside he was great, on the inside you didn't see the struggles and the everyday battle that that dude went through. And his only way that he felt was out was to take his life and then into pain. And I th that's, that's another big thing I'm trying to like get people to understand is just because someone looks like they're okay does not mean that they're okay. You know? Right. It's like right. It's, it's an angel with a broken wing. I mean, you know, it's sad. Well, one of the biggest things that I like to push with uh, What Makes Us Fire is it's okay to not be okay. It's just not okay to stay there. Right? Right. Yeah. So it's okay to feel sad, depressed broken, upset, worthless. Those feelings, as bad as they are, they're okay to feel. They're okay to have, right? But just because you are feeling those things does not mean those things are you. Just because you're sad doesn't mean you're a sad person. Just because you're upset doesn't mean you're an upset person. You have to try, and it is try, you have to try to realize that it is just an emotion. That you can, if you work hard enough, you can get through. It takes a lot of work. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. It's an everyday battle. No, it's, it's exhausting. It's exhausting. However, we need to be able to realize that we can work through it. We can. Biologically, we can. Through uh, therapy, through you know, talking, being open sharing our stories the more you talk about it the easier it is to 
sometimes when you talk about it, you have an aha moment yourself. You know, you're like, oh, yeah, that's yeah. what it is. Oh, my God. I just realized it right now talking to you that this is why I've been feeling this way. Holy crap. What an aha moment now. Now you can yeah. start the process. Mm -hmm. I'm working on that. And yeah. I, I always say, you know, the first process is to first admit it to yourself and be okay with it. Allow it to be okay that you do have a, an issue. You do have an illness. Second, is to start telling people like your process. You first admit it to yourself and then you started letting the people in your life know where you were at. And then you started seeking the help therapy, you know, a, a priest and, and you're still through that process as am I. And you are actually, and what you have created is actually a stepping stone and a process that people can use. And I want to say, Thank you for doing that, Ryan. It takes it takes tremendous will and strength to be who you are, right? To be the true self and be okay with who you are, broken and good and all and everything in between. And then find a way to help others. Yeah. You're who you are. You're not acting in any way. You're not sharing anything that isn't true. You're just being you, but you found a way by just being you to help others. And I think that if more people can find that within themselves, this world would be a lot better place. It would, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Where do you want your content to go? What what do you want to build with what you're currently building? I mean, it's new. It's still only two months old. <laughs> Uh, yeah. But do you um, have any plans with what you're doing? I mean, you, there's so many avenues that you can take with your outreach right now. There's so many avenues that you can take. Like for me, it was starting the nonprofit, right? For me, the nonprofit is to help first responders, civil service, and active retired military to get inpatient mental health treatment, right? We're going to help them financially. The reason being is because for me, I had to make the decision to not go because I couldn't afford it, right? Yeah. And it's not that I just couldn't afford the actual cost of going. I couldn't afford missing work. You know, right. how am I going to pay the mortgage? How am I going to pay the car bills? How am I going to do this? How am I going to do that? I, I, I had finances were a really big deciding factor on me getting that help. So I said to myself, I don't want that to be a deciding factor for anybody else that is making the choice to go better themselves. Yeah. So I came up with the idea, let's create a nonprofit and we will help those that are looking to get the help that want the help. We'll either, we're either going to give them a grant to help pay for direct costs for the treatment and, or we're going to give them a grant to help take care of a month or two of mortgage, a car bill. That way they don't have to worry about missing work and losing out on any type of income while they're getting help and getting better. And that's yeah. what I started. And literally the paperwork is filed right now. I'm just waiting to hear back from the state. It's the holiday season. So who knows when that's going to be, yeah. but people have really Actually, jumped wow. on. Yeah. People have really jumped on board and, and, and nobody's <laughs> really, really heard about this idea before. And so I'm blessed in that. I have this idea and it's kicking off and people are really behind it. I think you can do something similar, whether it be create a peer support network or, and by peer support network, it's literally just people like yourself that are willing to share their story, not mental health experts, but people like yourself that are willing to share their story to, in hopes, help others. Right, yeah. and, I, and I've I've struggled with where I want to take it, like because it did. I do it just happened. It's literally felt like it just happened overnight, and that's like everybody's like, "Man, you're making money off TikTok," and I'm like, "Dude, I haven't. I've lost money. <laughs> like, I've lost money making them. I, I don't. I'm not in the creator fund. I don't get anything for doing them. Um, you know. So I wanted to build a brand, and you know, I'm, I'm in the works of doing that, but. I, that's a good question, man. Like, 
I just want to bring the utmost amount of awareness that I can. I just don't really know what's going to be the best route to do that. Again. So, I, you know, I, the only thing, like, I will wake up. I know since I had a bad dream, like, a lot of those inner demon videos that I do are real dreams or conversations that I've had, like, with myself. So, when that happens, I will usually stop what I'm doing and make it the video of exactly what just happened. So, a lot of, like, the content that comes to me, um, it's it's all based on something that I have gone through, am going through, or that I feel I probably will go through. So, you know, it's just something to help people feel like, hey, I'm not alone. I understand this dude gets it. You know, he, you know, he's dealing with the same struggles as I am. But I'd love to start something to just have a place where people can go to feel safe is, is like a big, big thing. To me. I want to propose something to you. You have NAO, not an option. Where did that come from? So when I was on the police department, we had what were called NAO units, and they were neighborhood assistant officers. So they weren't police officers. They were just NAO assistant officers. So they would go, like, stop traffic for you, and they were like a big advocate for us. They were just normal people who just wanted to give back. And, you know, I always used to tell them, like, you know, since you know being a police officer was not an option for you, that's why you're the mayor. You're the not an option guy. <laughs> and, you know, it, we would we would just pick fun at each other. Well, then it kind of grew. So like we would when we would do like raids or kick doors in or anything like that, we would always like I would be like, "Yo, there's not an option. Do we're all coming out of here?" You know, and we would always just say "Mayo," and um, that's where it kind of grows. So for me, like. No matter what I'm going through in my life, I know that suicide is not an option. Quitting is not an option. Failure is not an option. So, you know, that's kind of where I came around. And, you know, when I started putting that in my videos, hashtag that people were like, dude, fine. Yeah, no, I get that. Like, dude, that's, I can do anything else, but ending it is not an option. So that's kind of where, where that came from. I want to make a proposal to you right here, right now. And I want you to think about it. You don't have to give me an answer. Okay. With the What Makes Us Fire Foundation, we are more than just giving the grants. We are creating other avenues for people and other resources for people. We are going to have, you know, motivational speakers, uh, people sharing their stories of where they were at, where they're at now, and showing other people that are struggling that you can get out of this. There are examples, but we also creating a peer support network and that peer support network right now is just the what makes us fire peer support network. However, I would love for you to consider if we made that the not an option peer support network. When those people that do need somebody to talk to you'd be the one willing to share your story in hopes that it's going to help them. We're going to guide them. We're going to let them know what we did, yeah. what we didn't do, what worked, what didn't yeah. work. I think if we can give an actual name to that peer support network, the not an option network, that would just sound, that to me sounds awesome. <laughs> and I think it would give you an avenue to really share that awareness that you're trying to share. You would be a part of yeah. the motivational speakers that we have sharing your story, sharing your current struggles, sharing what you've gone through, how you got through it and how you're managing. I would love for you to consider that. And I will give you more details on what that would Absolutely. mean. I would give you more details on what that would mean in the long run. But I think with someone like you and the drive that you have to share this message and the God to honest feeling of just wanting to help, I can feel that from you. I can feel that you just really just, you really just want to help. You don't want people to go through what you went through. And I think that if we work together, we can help each other 
share those messages that we're trying to share. I'm going to talk to you after we stop recording and maybe yeah. we can, I'll let you know a little bit. So think about it, okay. sit on it. What makes us fire family? You just heard it. I offered him. So if he says no, get on his ass about it. <laughs> <laughs> kidding. I'm kidding. If he wants to take his own it. thing, dude, if you want to take your own thing and take it with you, for me, it's just an idea. You can still go off and do your own thing, but I would, I would still love for you to consider yeah. being a part of it. I'm going to start winding this yeah. down. Um, usually when I start winding it down, I, I ask about three questions. The first one's a little bit two part, but first I want to say thank you for everything that you have shared. Thank you for being open. Thank you for being honest. As you were sharing your story, you know, you always say, and you've said it before that you feel like you can't really show emotion. We, we saw that emotion, man. I saw it and people are going to hear and they're going to see it too through this egg. You you might think that you feel that you, you have this part of you that you can't show for whatever reason, you don't know why, but dude, you 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 are showing it, whether you think so or not. Yeah. You are. And I I greatly appreciate the fact that you are open to sharing it and being honest with your story and sharing that information so people can in the long run, hope they learn from it and feel from it and know that there is a way out. It, it's not easy. It's ugly. It's a fight, but it can be done. Yeah. My first question to you, brother, is fairly simple. We're going to call this the Not an Option podcast. <laughs> I, I just like that saying. Not an Option <laughs> podcast. And you're the host. Yeah. Right, Ryan, you're the host of Not an Option Podcast, right. but you're interviewing Ryan from TikTok, the Not an Option Podcast host. What's the one question you would have asked yourself and or piece of information you'd like to share that maybe we didn't get to touch on? I had to ask myself one thing, and I don't have an answer for it. Uh, somebody actually asked me this when I was young. Who are you? And I like when he asked me that, like I struggled with the answer because I didn't know who I was. And, you know, he's like, not what makes you, not what pushes you. Like, who are you? Like, what, what are you? What, who truly are you? And that's probably what I would ask myself. And I ask that same question to people all the time. Like, who are you? And if you don't have that answer, and you can't answer that, start looking for it. Because, you know, you're not maybe going to be the same person in 10 years as you are from now, but who are you today? And if you don't like who you are today, it's time to change. That's probably what I would, I would probably ask myself. Well, you just answered it, too. You said you didn't have an answer. You just <laughs> answered it. You You answered it by saying, I don't know, but I'm searching. That's an answer. Yeah. Okay. That that's who you are. <laughs> yeah. But 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 and that and but that's part of who you are, right? I mean, yeah. right now you might not have the complete you don't might not have the complete answer, but you have an answer. And that answer yeah. is actually a good it's a legitimate answer. I don't know right now, but I am finding the strength to figure it out. And yeah. that's that's the answer. And that's a good question too. And I think that's actually a really good practice to do is to start asking yourself who am i really i'm not just a firefighter i'm not just a podcaster i'm not just some guy that started this nonprofit. i'm not just a husband i'm not just a father i'm not just a friend a son i'm not I, those are things that are part of me sure but i'm like you i i don't know really who i am but i'm searching yeah. i'm searching yeah. i'm searching hard I appreciate that. My uh, second to last question for you, Ryan, is a very simple one. It's, do you have any questions for me? Any question at all? If I can't answer it, I will say, with all due respect, sir, fuck that question. Do you have another one? I said, with all due respect. I said, with all due respect. Yeah. So you know, <laughs> I can say whatever I want to say after that. Do you have any questions for me, man? 
kicks you going. Ooh. Set aside all the podcast. <laughs> set aside all the social media. What keeps you going? Just in you. Out of everything else, what keeps you going? So before September 20th, 2020, I didn't have anything. I didn't. I didn't. September 20th, 2020 almost killed me. Literally. But through an amazing support system, through an amazing wife, through an amazing uh, friends and the fire department and starting to realize I needed to change. And then through therapy, what keeps me going now is realizing that I deserve to be happy. I deserve to be happy for me and for me first. And the reason why I deserve to be happy for me and for me first is because I deserve to be the best me for me so I can be the best me for all those other people in my life. That's what keeps me going. I have not convinced myself. No, I didn't convince myself. I realized that I deserve to be happy. I yeah. deserve it because I am me. Simple as that. That's what keeps me going. So when I hit those low points, when I get stressed or I have struggle or I'm learning something new about myself. I have learned so many new things about myself through this process, man. I never knew. I mean, from the childhood tragedy to the damn near tragedy uh, just a few months ago, I, 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 I still battle those things, but I know now that I deserve to be happy. And that's what keeps me going. Through, through all the stresses, through all the unknowns, through all the being fucking fearful and scared to death of what it means. Knowing that I deserve to be happy is what keeps me going and keeps me trying to be better. That's what it is. I, I realize that that is something I deserve as a human being, as me just being me. I deserve it. Just like everybody else deserves it. But sometimes they, you just don't feel like you do. Sometimes, yeah. you know, we always hear that that's a common thing. You feel like a burden to people or you feel like a waste of space or you're taking up air, or whatever, right? I finally realized that those things were depression, anxiety, my PTSD. That's what was telling me those things. And I allowed those things to be who I thought I was. And it wasn't until I finally realized I needed help that, shit, I, I do deserve to be happy. I am a good person. I know I am. I know I'm a good person inside. So why do I feel like I'm not to, towards myself? And so the quest of being happy for me by being me is something that keeps me going. That's what it is. <laughs> That's actually a really good question. I haven't been asked that question yet. And yeah. I want to say thank you for asking that because it really made me, I mean, I had to think about it for a couple of <laughs> seconds there. I was just like, holy shit. Yeah, no, that's what it is. Yeah. My last question to you, Ryan, um, you're on What Makes Us Fire podcast. Uh, we are very mental health uh, forward with first responders, and civil service, military. Um, you being a former Leo and having a brother in the military definitely falls in line with all that. So when I say what makes us fire, really, I say fire because I'm a firefighter, but really it's like what makes a civil service? What makes us people that have decided to make a sacrifice of ourselves, whether it be time, emotion, money, whatever, we made a sacrifice of ourselves for others. What do you think it is? that makes us that. Pain. 
I think somewhere along the lines, and speaking really probably mostly to myself, I think we have all experienced some type of pain. And I think that we are willing to go through more pain to save other people to have to deal with that pain. I'm literally willing right now to go out and die for somebody that I've never met just so that you can breathe another day because I've felt what it feels like to not be able to breathe another day. So I think a lot of your firefighters, your your military, your police, it is a drive, your EMS, it is a drive in all of you to just leave your little mark on the world is that someone that gave a shit about you. And it's 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 a it's a very strange it's a, it's a hard question, but it's, at the same time, it's the easiest question because people used to ask me, "Why do you want to be a cop?" And really came back down to, oh, "I want to help people, I want to make a difference." But somewhere along the lines, that gets lost in the wash, and we forget why we started that to begin with, and we focus a lot of times on the negative, and negativity is like a cancer. Once that grabs onto you, it spreads and it just slowly kills you. So I think every person, and I know you've heard this a thousand times, when you first start that job, when you first start any kind of civil service job, you go into it with the mentality of, I will do anything and everything I can to help somebody. And then the trials of fire slowly get to you, and you lose the concept of why we started it to begin with. And it really comes down to we started this job to help people and to make a difference where others couldn't. And I don't know what's happened in the world. I really don't. And it's almost every civil service person is under fire right now. But we're also the first person that you call when you need help. And, you know, at the end of the day, I don't care if you're black, white, straight, gay, Asian, Indian trans, whatever it is you are, we all bleed the same color of blood and we are all part of America. And it's time that we start treating people like humans and not defining each other by what we think that they are. And I think the world would just be a better place if we would all just sat down and find some calm ground. I put my pants on just like everybody else does one leg at a time every day. And I think if you would really sit and put yourself in that person's shoes, if you're a civilian, and you sit and you look at that officer you're like, yeah, he's kind of hardened right now, but at one time he started this to help. Don't ever lose sight of why he started that job. And that's to make a difference. That was you started with pain. And that's one of the, the, that's literally the first time I've heard that. And that not only because we felt that pain, but because we don't want others to feel it either because we do want to help people. And I think sometimes that does get lost, but I think it's still there. It's just the job had kind of hardened us. Right. It it hardened us and it hardened us because we, we didn't realize how much pain there is in the world until we got into what the fuck we were doing. Right. And the idea that you put uh, about not caring about who you are, you know, black, white, green, yellow, trans, gay, straight, bi, atheist, Christian, doesn't matter, right? Because in our line of work, we have all those people. We have all those people in the line of work. Yeah. In the line of work we do, in civil service and military, though all those people exist. But all those people coexist because they have a common mission, right? They have a common goal. And you alluded to it. If we, as a general public can figure out what that common goal is that we're all that we can all work towards we can be just as good as these civil service jobs where we have all these people with different backgrounds political backgrounds doesn't matter we all work well together we all love each other we're all going to die for each other if need be right and then we do that with the general public we'll die for you if we need to We need to do that. We need to have that common goal, I think, in the civil world, the, the civil, in general public, in the general populations. We like to talk about it in the civil service realm. Is a general pop or a civilian. If we have that common goal of just being good to each other, that's, that's all really it would take. 
no one's better than anybody else. Everybody bleeds. Everybody's yeah. going to die. The only two things guaranteed in life is you're born and you're dead. Everything in between is a choice and you can choose to be better. Yeah. Well, Ryan, brother, I really appreciate you coming on again. Thank you so much for your time, for your story. I'm going to edit out all the parts that fucked up. So it's going to sound, it's going to sound a lot better. I promise. Um, I apologize for my connection issues. Apparently I have a internet outage. Uh, is there anything else you want to share? Where can people find you? Yeah, let's go with that. Where can people find you? Uh, are you, what, what social media links are you on? Stuff like that. Um, so I'm on Instagram and TikTok. So uh, they're both the same handle. I'm a die happy three or four. So you can find me on TikTok and Instagram. I do not have Facebook um, or anything like that. That's really about the only two social media platforms that I have. Um, I kind of keep it just to those. All right. What makes us fire family? Anybody listening? Go follow. I'm a die happy. I M M A G O I N D I E H A P P Y. Right? Or yeah. did I do I M M A Yeah. I M M A Die D I E happy H A P P Y. I'm a I'm a die happy. happy. No G. No no it's going when you try there. yeah. No G, yeah, yeah. When you try to spell it out, it's actually a lot harder than our. <laughs> Y'all go follow Mr. <laughs> Ryan Willard. He has some amazing content out there. For anybody else out there that's looking for help or, or is in any crisis whatsoever, please reach out. Let us help you, guide you into the direction that we need to get you in to get you right. I know you can reach out to Ryan. You can reach out to myself. You can reach out to any one of our respective families uh, with the not an option family and with what makes us fire family. Let us guide you. Let us help you. We are not mental health experts, but we are experts in sharing our story. And with those stories allow us to guide you ryan brother again thank you what makes us fire family you guys have fun stay safe get out there and show some love and peace out in the world you never know who needs it you never know if you're going to be the one to make the difference and being the one that makes the difference feels fucking amazing yeah, nice. let's be the change we want to see out in the world peace what i tell you guys Ryan is one hell of a man. Being able to share his story the way he does and hearing how he battles through the shit in his head every day and where it almost took him, I think makes it very humbling to know that no matter who you are or how strong you think you are, it can get you. And it can do one fucking number on you. But if you're willing and you realize it, you can fight and you can fight back. You have to make the choice though. You have to come to that realization like Ryan did and start talking about it, not only with yourself, of course, that being the first thing to do, but with those around you, with the people that love you, with the people that care, allow them to know where you're at and where your headspace is at. That way, if God forbid anything were to go wrong, they can be there for you. What makes us fire family? I want to say thank you for listening. Thank you for sharing. Thank you for being a part of the What Makes Us Fire family. Please continue to like, share, and distribute the What Makes Us Fire podcast along with the What Makes Us Fire social media sites on TikTok, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, and Snapchat with the tag at What Makes Us Fire. You can also follow us on YouTube. Please like and subscribe all the videos. Check them out. You can see the pretty faces behind the weird voices. And you can find us at What Makes Us Fire Space Podcast on YouTube. You'll see the logo. You'll see the episodes. You'll see my ugly mug. It's all well and good. 
Also, anybody out there, if you feel like you're in crisis and you feel like you need some help right now, the National Suicide Prevention Hotline is 100% confidential, 100% free, and you can remain 100% anonymous. Start the conversation. If you need help, reach out. The number is 1-800-273-8255. Again, the number is 1-800-273-8255. If making the phone call is just a little bit too much for you, you can always go online to suicidepreventionlifeline.org where you'll find a multitude of resources, blogs, videos, uh, just things to help you on your journey to getting your mental health right. What Makes Us Fire family, as you all know, we have started the What Makes Us Fire Foundation, a foundation, a nonprofit foundation to help first responders, civil service members, active and retired military to get inpatient mental health treatment. If you don't know, mental health treatment, inpatient mental health treatment is an elective treatment, i.e., the federal government people look at it as something that you can choose to fix like you know um, getting a boob job or something unfortunately mental health is still fighting that battle in trying to really re make people realize this is a real thing we don't choose this however for right now and the way it is it's expensive to go because it is elective most insurance companies, if they cover it at all, will only cover a small percentage. So what makes us fire foundation has dedicated itself to helping those members that are seeking that treatment financially. We are either going to help them with direct costs to the treatment and or with cost of living expenses while they're in treatment, i.e. a mortgage, car payment, something so they don't have to worry about missing work while they're getting better. In saying all that, we are asking for a donation to the What Makes Us Fire Foundation through the cash app with money sign What Makes Us Fire. Any little bit helps all of it's going to go help in building the foundation so we can actually start helping those wanting to go get the help they feel they need. I don't want finances to be a reason why they don't go get that help. Let's, let's take that factor away. Let's get rid of finances as being a factor for our first responders and our civil service members in getting help. I love you guys. You guys are amazing. Thank you so much. Be on the lookout. What makes us fire? We are growing. We are looking to get another sponsor here soon. I know this ending and uh, this closing is a little bit long, but I just want to let you all know we are growing. We are making it happen. We are going to succeed in this. I love you all. Have fun. Stay safe. Let's show some love and peace out in the world. You never know who's going to need it. You never know if you're going to be the one to make the difference. And being the difference just feels fucking amazing. So let's go be the change we want to see in the world. Peace.